Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I promised Buford that I would give my full name when I started this morning, so my name is Carlos Mario Francisco Cortez. But well, you may call me Chico. <laughs> I'm a Puerto Rican with an Irish disease. Actually, I was born in the capital of Puerto Rico. That's New York City. I'd like to thank the committee for being so gracious to us, allowing us to take part of the 40th Alabama Northwest Florida Conference. We're really happy to be here, and I just want to thank them for allowing us that privilege. About this time, I usually feel like Liz Taylor's next husband. I know what to do. I just don't know how to make it more interesting. That's what I like. I love the, the laughter that you hear in the fellowship because that's really the love coming out, you know, just bubbling out, and I love it. I mean, the fellowship encompasses everything that happens to us. It encompasses our heartaches and our happiness and, and our anger and all of that, and, and it's just such a, when you're here and you're immersed in the laughter and the warmth of the fellowship, you know you're home. And there's one story that I like to tell about has something to do about fellowship. You may have heard it. This old couple retired, and they moved to the country, and they thought they'd supplement their income by raising pigs. So they bought a sow, and they had her out in the yard there where they could look at her every now and then, see how she was coming along, but she never had any pigs. So they went to the vet, and they said, we've got this sow, and she, we want to raise pigs, and she doesn't have any pigs. So he said to him, well, do you have a boar? He said, nope. He said, well, you've got to have a boar with the sow to have the pigs. But the farmer down the road, he's got a boar, so if you take her down there for some fellowship, (laughs) by and by you'll have some little pigs. So he got the sow, and he loaded her up on the wheelbarrow, and he took her down the road there to the neighbor and left her with the boar all day long, picked her up that night, took her back. Next morning, no pigs. He did this for quite a while and there weren't any pigs and finally he said to his wife one morning I just can't bear to be disappointed again would you please go to the window and look and tell me if there are any little piglets out there so she went over and she pulled the curtain back and she looked and he said well well she said no but the sow's in the wheelbarrow waiting for you kind of catches on, doesn't it? <laughs> when I was about a year old, my parents uh, moved to Alexandria, Virginia. That's why I don't sound like I come from New York. And we moved to, to this town. There was about 33,000 people in Alexandria, Virginia at the time. And we were probably one of the few people that spoke Spanish in that town. So uh, when, And I didn't speak English, so I went to school. So when we walked down the street, everybody kind of looked at us, and that's the first time I remember feeling different. As I got a little older, I realized that I even was a little different from my parents because my mother and father both had black hair and brown eyes, and I kind of was a throwback to the French and the Spanish and, and didn't have black hair and brown eyes, and I wanted to look like them. And I always felt that I never quite belonged I don't know if I was born an alcoholic, but I certainly had a lot of it going for me. You know, it was like all of you were invited to the rehearsal of life, and you learned your lines, but they forgot to invite me. So I went through life not knowing my lines. I was the kind of kid growing up in school. I guess now you'd say, you know, uh, I don't know what they call them now, nerds, I guess. You know, <laughs> dweebs, is that it? But I was the brain in the class. You know, I was the smartest kid in the class and all that, and Going along with that and the personality that I was developing that would eventually blossom into full-fledged alcoholism, I could never be wrong. 
And I remember one time in school when we were reading this little story that you all probably read in school as I was going to St. Ives. I met a man with nine wives, and, you know, each wife had nine kids or cats or whatever they had, and on and on, right? And goes on. Well, I read it, and I said, as I was going to St. Louis, I met a man with nine wives and read my little portion. The teacher stopped me, and she said, now, children, what did Carlos read wrong? And this one little girl in the back went, I know, I know. She's probably an al on today. <laughs> <clears throat> she said, he said, St. Louis, and it's St. Ives, you know. And so the teacher said, would you read that again? And so now I got the book. And, of course, I couldn't be wrong, so I said, as I was going to St. Louis. <laughs> also, I was not a good sport in school. I, didn't, I wasn't good at, at games. I was always the shortest one in my class, you know, all the way up, you know. And uh, I'm still the shortest one in my class, right? <laughs> Just so you know, I am standing up. <laughs> so I was a kid that when they chose sides, they picked me last. You know, I was a team liability. And one time I was playing... We were playing softball, and usually when I hit the ball was if the ball accidentally hit the bat. You know, that's sort of the way that worked. <clears throat> and I hit the ball this time, and I ran to first base, and I made it there. Now, the first baseman had the ball in his glove, and he was kind of standing like this. And he was waiting for me to step off the base. Now, I knew the ball was in his glove, but I looked at my teammates, and something happened. When I looked in their eyes, I saw they expected something of me. Responsibility. I had to perform, and I looked at them, and I looked at second base, and I looked at third base, and I looked at home plate, and I stepped off from the base, and I let him tag me out, because it seemed to be an easier, softer way. And in just that manner, I continued to be tagged out in the game of life for a lot of years thereafter. I had my first drunk in New York City at my uncle's house. And I remember that when I, when I drank that alcohol, that suddenly I felt different. I was a conversationalist. I was debonair. I was charming to the women. I was 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but I remembered what it felt like. And I also got drunk that night, the very first time, because I figured the same thing that Bryant figured, you know, if two is good, four is better, and you know what the end result of that is. My father died when I was 13 years old, and I had already begun to get in trouble. I had already started to use drugs, and I was already drinking, and we moved to Puerto Rico to live with my mother's family. And that's when I really started drinking on a daily basis, because I found out that I could be 13 years old and walk up to the bar and order something to drink, and I did. And that became the most important thing that I had to do. Uh, my grades in school started to go down, and uh, I really didn't like school there. They had me in a private school, and uh, we moved back to Florida, to West Palm Beach. And it didn't take me very long to find other people that were sort of the way that I wanted to be. And we gravitated to the type of environment that uh, made me comfortable. And we have these streets in every town. The street was a whole row of, of barbecue stands and little bars, you know. I used to hang around one that was called Trouble's Place, so you kind of had an idea what to expect when you went in. And I hung around there, and I knew all the criminals, and I knew all the petty thieves, and I knew all the hookers, and I knew all the drug dealers, and I knew everybody on the street, and I thought I was cool. And I would hang around there, and I would get in trouble, and we, you know, we learned all the things we learned on the street to survive, how to rob people, and how to do all of these things. And I learned how to use more drugs, and I learned how to, to drink even better than I had before. There was a cop in this town. It was the only Spanish cop in West Palm Beach at the time, and he was kind of in charge of me. And one night I was standing in front of his barbecue stand about 2 in the morning, and another cop pulled up, and he tried to talk to me. And I did what I always did at a time like that. I looked at him, and I said, no comprendo. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So he, he's trying to talk to me, and he's doing all this, you know, how old are you? And I'm saying, no comprendo, you know, and, and so another car pulls up. Guess who it is? So he was a sergeant, and the Spanish cop gets out, and the other cop goes over to him, and he says, I got this kid here, Puerto Rican kid. I think he's underage. He doesn't speak any English, and the sergeant, his name was Suarez, he looks at me, and he says, him? He speaks better English than you, don't you, Chico? And I said, that's right. <laughs> There was a movie back in those days called The Wild One, Marlon Brando. Now, Marlon Brando was cool, and he had this motorcycle, right? He had the motorcycle jacket. He talked cool and all that. Well, I was too poor to afford a motorcycle, so I got the jacket and just pretended my motorcycle was somewhere else. And one of the times that I got arrested, which was, you know, not an unusual thing, and they took me down to the police station for a little interrogation. They took us to the back of the station house there, and as they shoved us around a little bit, I remembered what Marlon Brando said in the movie. And I said to those cops, man, my old man could hit harder than that. But I was wrong. <laughs> and I promptly admitted it. <laughs> You know, this was a period in my life where I would get up in the morning and the first thing that I would do would be to drink or to smoke a joint, you know, every morning. Because by the time that I was 16 years old, I knew the difference between wanting a drink and needing a drink. By the time that I was 16 years old, I had already gone through so many sets of friends who were some of them drank pretty bad and they said you're worse than we are we don't want to hang around with you so you know after a while you start running out of people to to hang around with we got together one night a bunch of us and we decided we were going to give West Palm Beach some thrills so we got one guy and we put ketchup on his arm and put him in the trunk of the car and stuck his arm out so it sort of hang like this you know and uh we thought we'd ride around town and, you know, give her, I mean, I don't know what would happen nowadays. You probably wouldn't survive it, but, you know, back then it was different. So we're riding up and down West Palm Beach, and the guy's got his arm in the trunk. We had a wedge so he could kind of see at the same time, and people were following us, and, you know, and <laughs> it was a black Chevy, and they're, you know, they figured it was a murder or something. So after we rode around for a while, we said, well, we'll go down to Lake Worth, and we'll go give all the old folks down there something to really think about. So we started driving down US-1 real slow, cruising along with arm, hanging out like this, you know. And we got about two, three miles down the road, and there's a roadblock. Man, I never saw so many cops in my life. We made a left turn, and they were waiting for us up the other street. They had us at the corner. And they got out with their guns drawn. The guy in the trunk pulled his arm in and closed the trunk. <laughs> That was strange. <laughs> they said, they said, okay, boys, open up the trunk. And we said, we don't have anything in the trunk. And they said, open the trunk. They had guns, so we figured, well, okay, you know. I, had, I remember I had a stiletto with a six and a half inch blade, and I put it in my boot because I thought maybe they won't find it, and, and I didn't want to lose it, you know. So <clears throat> we open up the trunk, and this guy comes out, and he is, he's laughing so hard he sounds hysterical. And the cops are saying, what's the matter, son? What's the matter, son? Are you all right? Are you all right? Is that blood? And he finally, laughing, blurts out, ketchup. <laughs> well, I can tell you that that was my first experience with seeing someone else have a profound personality change right before my eyes. <laughs> because the cops just, all of a sudden, their whole demeanor changed. And they said, okay, boys, do you know where the county jail is? And we said, oh, yeah, we've been there lots of times, you know. So, <clears throat> so we had a little parade going back to West Palm Beach with a police car in front of us and a motorcycle in front of him and a couple of police cars behind us and, you know, us in the middle. And uh, we went to the county jail. And uh, when we got there, I think about every deputy sheriff in Palm Beach County that could get there was there because when we walked in, all we saw was cowboy hats and these two co uh, cops, West Palm Beach policemen, that brought us there. And uh, the deputy said, 
to them, well, boys, I see you got the killers, you know, and all the other deputies went, <laughs> you know. So I was real glad they put us in jail. I didn't want to go back to the station house. <laughs> well, that was a fun story, but most of them weren't fun. Now, I got married at the age of 18 and, and uh, for the first time, and I like to say that because I noticed in AA that a lot of us speak of marriage in uh, plural, right? So... <laughs> I ran away and got married, and the best way I can typify this is to tell you that the first six Christmases in a row, I never made it home. We had three children in this marriage, and uh, they grew up in an atmosphere where uh, they lived with an alcoholic father, where if he w was drinking and he went out, everyone was relieved that he would go out, but then wondered what he would be like when he came home. We lived in the house where furniture got thrown around and glasses got smashed. And, and uh, one night uh, uh, when they were hiding in the bedroom, I tried to chop the door down with a machete and, and uh, all of these things like this that go on. Uh, my in-laws had said to me numerous times, why do you drink like that? Why can't you drink like we do? And I would say, well, this or that or one other thing or another. And finally one day I said, I don't know. And that was the first time that a glimmer of honesty came in to what I had to say about it. I would go along for a while, and I wouldn't drink, and I'd say, well, I'm going to go to church. I did that for six weeks one time, and I didn't drink, and I thought I was doing so good I should reward myself. So I went out and got drunk, and that was the end of that. Uh, I'd get off work in the afternoon, and I'm an electrician by trade, and, and I would get that 4.30 beer. And that would start me going. And everything, the entire trip home, was not based on how many miles I drove, but how many beers I would need. You know, how long would it take me to go from the liquor store to the convenience store to the next convenience store, wherever it was where I would buy on the way home? Eventually, what happened was that my my father-in-law at the time said to me, I'm going on a religious retreat, and you have to go with us. <laughs> I was sort of the family problem. You know, it's when you sit in the other room, and they're in the other room, and they're all talking and looking, right? <laughs> Somehow you know they're talking about you, and it's not good. So we went on this religious retreat, and they had a speaker one night there, and he was 23 years old, and his name was Mike. And he said, my name is Mike O, and I'm an alcoholic. And I went, whoa, because I had been with him on his first drunk. And, of course, you know what we think. We think, how can he be an alcoholic? If he's an alcoholic, what does this mean for me? So afterwards, I went and talked to Mike. And I was trying to get him to tell me that, well, maybe you're an alcoholic, because I didn't want to say I was. And Mike never would tell me. And finally, he said to me, well, Chico, I will tell you this. I think you have good potential. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's good. At least I have some potential, you know. <laughs> well, not too long after that, I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was December the 5th of 1965. I came to AA. And I remember a few things about when I came there. I had, by this time, been in jail a lot of times. I had been arrested for everything from uh, drunk and disorderly to grand larceny. I had been cut up in fights. I had cut people up in fights. I had uh, robbed people. I had been drunk for days and at a time. I had, uh, hadn't really been sober at all for more than six weeks at any time. Had been, uh, by this time, I, I was not divorced, but I was separated, and I didn't have any friends, and the only reason I had a job was because I worked for my father-in-law. And right off the bat when I came in, some little old lady came up to me, and she said, it is so nice that you came to AA before you had trouble. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I knew she didn't even have a clue what trouble was. <laughs> and I remember the old timers. I was, I was 25 years old. I remember the old timers came around, and they said things like, kid, I spilled more booze than you ever drank. And I would say, well, you shouldn't have been so sloppy. <laughs> and I remember some of the real good old timers that came around that really wanted to help me. And they said to me, one of them gave me a big book. He said, read this book. 
And about a week later, he said to me, did you read the big book? I said, I sure did. And he said, well, read it again. And I said, why? How many times do you read a book? I just didn't get it. Someone else said to me, you should have a sponsor. But I knew I was just so smart, so much smarter than all of you, that I didn't need a sponsor. If there's ever anyone that graced the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous that didn't need a sponsor, it would be me. And I went to meetings, and eventually, you know, what happens, we go to meetings, and sometimes we get things back too soon, you know, you get the family back, the house back, and everything, and I started thinking, well, you know, I really don't need to go to so many meetings. After all, I've got at least two or three months under my belt now. (laughs) I need to get a part-time job at night. So I got a part-time job where I worked 38 hours a week, and I had a full-time job that I worked 54 hours a week, and... You know, I just couldn't find the time, Brian, to get to those meetings. I just couldn't find the time. And I had to get all these things back for my family that I thought they might have been deprived of. You know, like food and clothes and things like that, you know. I just had to do that. So I stopped going to meetings. I had a friend of mine. He later became my sponsor. He would come over all the time. He lived two, three blocks away from me. Chico, you got to go to meetings. You're going to get drunk. Remember what you were like when you came here in December. And I would say, Lynn, I don't need these meetings. You may need these meetings, but I don't. And besides, I was thinking in the back of my mind, I'm too young. I know it's an Irish disease. Doesn't have anything to do with me. And so eventually Lynn quit coming around. And I picked up that drink. Just before I picked up the drink, a week or two before, uh, we had two boys and a girl. My daughter, who was the youngest, was laying on the couch, and she had a convulsion or something, and she stopped breathing. And, you know, all hell broke loose in the house trying to get her to uh, breathe again. And I finally grabbed her and ran outside with her. I don't know why I did this, but I did. And I laid her on the grass, and I started trying to give her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. I've never done that before since. don't even know if I did it right. But I remember that every time I would breathe in her little lungs, they would expand. And every time that I would stop, they would stop. And I don't know if I could have really quit trying on my own. But I kept doing it. And eventually, she started to breathe and she started to cry and she lived. And I was thinking about getting drunk just before this happened. And you would think that at this point that I would say, if I hadn't been sober and alcoholic, I would thank God because my child would be dead now. And two weeks later, I was drunk as a skunk because it seemed so much more important at the time. That's what alcoholism is. I came to AA the first time, and I was very cool and casual about it. I didn't need you. Maybe you needed me. And I want to tell you that from that moment and In in 1966, until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous the last time, which was January the 20th of 1969, that's my sobriety date, and I thank God and AA for it, that I was never sober more than three weeks at any one time. That was my record. And I did notice a few things about y'all. I noticed that when I got up to get my 10th white chip of the month, (laughs) that the applause didn't seem as enthusiastic as I remembered it. (laughs) And it seemed to me like it had been a while since anybody had given me their phone number. But you know, I'd go out there and try it again, and I'd come back to AA. A lot of times I came to AA because there wasn't any place else to go. I had no illusions about the fact that I was going to die drunk, coming or going from AA, that I was not going to make it, that I was going to be one of these people we all talk about and read about and know about that don't make it, that we say, God, if they only could have hung in there, and I couldn't. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous a lot of times simply because I just needed to be around other clean-smelling, sober people, warm bodies to sit next to, not because I thought you were going to tell me something that was going to make a difference because I had given up. 
So when I see people that are in that position nowadays, I never say, well, he's never going to make it. Because I don't know that. And I'm sure people said it about me. On January 19th of 1969, I ended up at Lynn's house. He had become my sponsor in one of my trips in and out of AA. I ended up at his house, and at this time, I had lost some 40 pounds. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I was impotent. I've recovered from that since then. (laughs) (laughs) And alcohol had removed the family, the children, the home, the job, the car, because alcohol is a great remover. It removes everything except the stains on your soul. And here I sat, sick and shaking, and hate-filled and angry, because this had happened to me at Lynn's house. And I don't remember too much about that night, but I do remember Lynn saying to me, Chico, I don't think you're going to live much longer if you just give this a a real try. Just give it a try. Just one more time. I had planned prior to that some pretty terrible things to do. I had ended up living in the chicken coop, basically. There used to be chicken coops, and they remodeled them for people like me. (laughs) <laughs> and that's where I live. And uh, I had decided about a week before I went to see Lynn or a few days before that I was going to kill myself. And there was a group back then, some of you will remember, The Doors. And you remember the song, uh, um, oh, my God, I can't think of it now. What, isn't that awful? Anyway, now, they had this, this song. When, thank you. My wife's in Al-Anon. <laughs> when the music's over, Okay. <laughs> She, she just move her lips, except she knows I can't read lips and it drives her crazy. <laughs> when the music's over. And I had decided that I would play this and I would get on the couch and I'd drink and do my drugs and when the music was over, I would die. You've got to do it right now, come on, you know. <laughs> so I got the record player going and I laid on, the, on my contour couch, which originally wasn't contoured but became that way, you know, one of those, you know. And I laid there, and I waited for the record to end and me to die. And the record ended, and there, here I was. I was still alive. Man, what a disappointment. <laughs> hey, I had to get up now and rearrange all the pillows and straighten everything out, because I wanted to look good when you found me. <laughs> and I, somewhere along the way, while I was waiting for the music to end or die, I had a convulsion, and I fell off the couch, and, you know, then you don't look good at all when that's over. So <clears throat> that, I didn't die, and I ended up at Lynn's house. But the reason I ended up at Lynn's house was because I had gone to a meeting that night, and I, and I got there towards the end of the meeting, and I must have been hallucinating because the only thing I remember seeing is people from the waist down, you know. And uh, I don't know how you felt about hallucinations, but when I was sober about three weeks, I said to my sponsor, I'm so happy that I'm sober three weeks, but, you know, I'm Mr. Hallucinations. <laughs> he said, you know, you're really sick. <laughs> anyway, I had planned to go out with this shotgun and blow everybody away. I had a list of all the people that had harmed me. I didn't quite have that right either. And I was going to go out and kill them. And I had them in a priority basis in case I couldn't get to everybody. And I figured that somewhere along the way, the police would hear the mad dog Cortez was loose. And they'd gun me down and do for me what I couldn't do for myself. And I ended up, like I say, at a meeting, and I ended up at Lynn's house. And he said that to me, if you just give this one more try because you're going to die. And I looked at him, and I did probably one of the most arrogant things I've ever done in my life. I looked at Lynn, and I said, well, I'll go, but I won't listen. (laughs) Now, if this had been any place else in the world, they would have just kicked you out. He would have said, get out of here. Don't ever come back. Don't bother me. But, you know, Lynn, Lynn was an alcoholic just like me. And he could look past pain and the, all this phony bravado that I was putting up in front. And he could see that somebody was really in pain down deep inside, that I was hurting, that I was on my last leg. 
that there was no place else to go. And he said, that's all right, Chico. You don't have to listen. Just go sit your butt down at a meeting five nights a week, and that's all you have to do. Because he loved me. When I was sober three and a half months, I decided it was time to make decisions on my own, so I got married again. <laughs> now that tells you that there were at least two people in the program that day that had a death wish for each other. <laughs> Best thing I can say about that is that we saved two other people. Now, you already know that I wasn't well, but I'm going to, you know, tell you how, how not well I really was. I, I went to the psychiatrist at this time. My sponsor thought it might be a good idea. And I remember talking to him one day, and he said to me, look, you have a lot of hostility. And I said, you know what? If I thought only one of us could get out of this room alive right now, I'd jump up and kill you. <laughs> he went, <laughs> Our relationship did start to sort of deteriorate after that, but <laughs> he said to me, you need to do, find an outlet for this, so I would like you to go out and buy an axe. <laughs> so I said, well, okay. And uh, I mentioned it to my sponsor. I had another sponsor about this time, and he said, an axe? I don't even want you to have a butter knife in the house. <laughs> I mean, I was like down to spoons, you know? <laughs> So I had to go back to the shrink and I had to say to him, look, I can't have an axe, I can't have nothing. And he said, well, do you have a hammer? I said, sure. He said, okay, I want you to go out in the woods every day on the way home from work and I want you to smash rocks. Scream at them, yell at them, smash them. So I thought, well, okay, I'll try it. You know, so I went out and did it, right? Smashed up all these rocks. Man, that was the most boring thing I ever did. <laughs> I went back the next time to see him and he said, how'd it go? I said, terrible, man. Rocks don't bleed. Don't you know that? <laughs> and there was a guy in the area, his name was Artie. And he only had one arm. And uh, I, I was at the, you know, it wasn't fight or flight with me. It was fight or fight. And so everything that I had, if you borrowed my pencil, you better give it back. And I loaned Artie five bucks, and Artie didn't give it back. And then I'd hear him sitting at the meeting talking about going fishing on a drift boat or going to the movie or this and that. And I thought, my damn five dollars, that's what that is. <laughs> So I went home one day after work, and I got my machete, and I started honing that machete. <laughs> and my wife said to me, don't you think you should call your sponsor? <laughs> so I didn't want her to think that I was afraid to call him, so I called him, right? So I told him, you know, as I'm sharpening away here. Well, you know, this guy, he owes me five bucks, and I'm going up to the club, and he better have that damn five dollars, or I'm chopping his arm off, his only arm. <laughs> well, my sponsor had a moment of silence on the phone, and then he said to me, what do you think a judge would do to a guy that chopped the one-armed man's arm off? And I said, well, it ain't murder, and he said, well, if he lives, it ain't. So he suggested I pray for him and pretend I gave him the five bucks. Oh, I hated to do that. I mean, I hated to do that. But I started to pray for him, you know. First I said, well, Lord, I'm praying for that SOB. You know who he is. I don't even want to mention his name. He owes me five dollars. <laughs> he also told me to stay away from him. In case of prayer didn't work, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Lynn, my, I, I had two sponsors. This one sponsor, I, the, you know who he is, that was Ennis. It, I mean, he was a little to the right of Attila the Hun, you know. And then I had Lynn that was, that was you know, kind of good, and, and he, he was caring, you know. I, so I had a balance there. Except that Lynn would get mad at me every once in a while because I'd say, Lynn, you know what I think? And he'd say, no, that's the problem. You don't think. And I said, sure, I do. Those signs up there. Said, nope, they're not for you. They're for us. <laughs> he would say to me, what you need is you need a tremendous amount of ego reduction. 
I'd say, well, I mean, I don't think I'd go that far, but, you know. It's kind of like the story of the guy that married Lil Al Anon, and, they, you know, he was in the program, and they went off on their honeymoon, and she went in the shower to get ready, you know, and uh, he was waiting for her, and she came out in and, and her little negligee, and he said, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. Would you mind dropping your negligee? I just want to get a picture of you as you look right now. And she said, well, oh my God, it's kind of embarrassing, you know, our first night. Well, okay. So she did, and he took a picture. So she said, well, you know, don't you think, being I'm the way that I am, that maybe you should, you know, go get ready. So he went off and took a shower and came back out, you know, that towel wrapped around him, and he came out, you know, Mr. AA, Mr. AA stud, and he came out. <laughs> and she went, oh. Would you mind if I take your picture? And he went, oh, sure, baby. Uh, you want to keep it so you remember me forever like this? And she said, no, I just like to have it enlarged. <laughs> <laughs> That's ego reduction. <laughs> My sponsor said to me, you must do the steps. And I thought I did them because I read them. And he said to me, you have to do a written inventory. And he had me do that written inventory. And I took my fifth step with him. And a few months later, he said, you got to do another one. That one wasn't good enough. And he had a sponsor I called my grand sponsor. He's passed on now. And they would have conferences about me. And then they would come back and they would discuss what to do with me. And one of the things they decided was that I should get involved in service. And they said, you need to be the intergroup representative for your group. Well, I don't know how they worked this out because I wasn't, you know, Mr. Machete wasn't real popular in his group anyway. But, but I did become the intergroup representative. And for three months, I resigned to myself from intergroup on the way to the meeting. And then about the fourth month, I realized that y'all really needed a lot of help. <laughs> and maybe there was something I could contribute. And so I got active in service, and that became part of my, my, my program of recovery. I incorporated the, the activity that's involved in, in the service end of our fellowship. When I took about the third, fifth step that I took with my sponsor, I realized there was one area in my life that really had bothered me a lot. And that had to do with my father. Because when I was 12 years old, my, my father was out of work. He was sick. I didn't know he was dying at the time. I was just a kid. And we got in a big argument. And during this argument, I screamed at him, I hope you never work again. And a few months later, he died. And I thought, I gave him a death wish. And, you know, now here I was. I was 31 years old, I guess. And I still could hear those words, I hope you never work again. And I talked to my sponsor during one of my fifth steps. I may not have even put it down in others because it was just something I just couldn't deal with. And I said, what do I do now? What do I do now? And he said, well, you still have your mother, your aunt Liz, here. You haven't been the nicest person in the world. They're who they are and you're not going to change them. But you can try to show the love and compassion that you didn't show that time because you were just a stupid 12 year old kid. You can show that to them. And somehow I think it'll be okay. And so I started to do that. And it became okay. I listened to you, Brian, talking about the old timers, and God, I miss the old timers in our area. I remember the first time I was in a meeting, I looked around the room, and I was the soberest along the room. I mean, it just scared the hell out of me. I said, no, I'm not ready for this. I'm still one of the kids. Over the years, one by one, you know, we've gone to the funerals and the 
one by one, they've passed on. When I was delegate, I remember that the oldest old timer that was still living in our area came up to me and, and, uh, at one of his buddies' funeral, he said to me, you got to do the eulogy. And I said, Paul, I can't do the eulogy. I've never done a eulogy in my life. And he said, well, you're the delegate. And I said, well, okay. And it was, a, it was an old timer that I would known for a long time. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous in our era, 20 years was a long time. 20 years was a long time. And so... I got up in front of everybody there at the funeral home and I said, can we open this meeting with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer? And that's how we did it. I remember the last year I was at the conference as a South Florida delegate. We had kind of a busy two years. And we all held hands to close the conference, said the Lord's Prayer. And I remember standing up there crying like a baby. Not because I was sad that it was over, but because I was just so grateful to God that I had found a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. About that time, I had one of those chats that usually you gals reserve for men. You know, it's one when you say to your husband, we have to talk. <laughs> And I said to my wife, we have to talk. And I sat down with her and I told her all the things that I thought were not right in our relationship. And she told me some things too. And about six months later she said to me, well, I just can't be the kind of person that you need. And I said, well, we'll just work it out. And six years later we got divorced. Now, I was single. I hadn't been single hardly at all in my life. And I was single, and I did the dating scene for a while, and I thought, I don't want to be a, an emotional yo-yo, so I'm just going to go to meetings, and, you know, I'm never going to get married again, and I'm going to just go to meetings and sit around and lie about gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew that if I sent, sent my picture off to Lonely Hearts Club, they'd probably send it back and say, we're not that lonely. <laughs> And, you know, it's a funny thing how things work in life because it, it's kind of like a, there was a man in England that, that suffered from depressions and he decided to kill himself. And so he put a rope up around the rafters and he put it around his neck and he, he jumped off a chair and the rope broke. <laughs> so he got a knife and he wedged it between the boards on the floor and he threw himself on it and the blade broke. So he said, well, I'm going to just throw myself in the Thames River. So he got a cabbie, and they started going to the Thames River so he could jump off the bridge and, and kill himself. And on the way there, the fog came in, and they couldn't find the river. So he finally said to the cabbie, never mind, I'll find it myself. And as he's groping in the fog, trying to find his way to the river, he stumbles over a step. And as he gets up and he looks, it's the step to his own house. And he goes inside and he writes these words. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. That was William Coppers. And God does move in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. The only problem is usually I think I know better. But I was sitting around meetings lying about gratitude. And I went to this one meeting one night and uh, somebody different came in. And I looked and I thought, well, I've never seen her before. And after the meeting... Uh, I went over and we chatted. I said, can I have a hug? <laughs> hey, I said I was sober, not well. <laughs> and, you know, we talked so long that this, 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 this terrible person somewhere in the room kept turning the lights on and off. I think he wanted us to leave or something. And I had said to her, of course, I want to impress her. And I had said to her, well, you know, I was the delegate. She said, I'm the intergroup representative, <laughs> and I'm the program chairman for my group for the month. And I said, oh, isn't that sweet to myself? She's going to ask me to speak. And she said, and I have everybody scheduled to speak. Would you like to come and hear a good speaker? <laughs> Ego reduction. 
<laughs> so I went to the meeting, you know, I said I allowed that maybe I would, and uh, I got ready to go to the meeting that night. I spent two or three hours trying to get okay, you know, go to the meeting. Got finished early, and I had to drive around because you can't come too early. You got to get in just the right time so you look cool, you know. <laughs> so I came strutting in like this little bantam rooster, right? Here I am, stand back, you know. And saw her. We talked a little bit. We went to sit down. She sat down and put her purse next to her. Well, hell, I didn't know that was a signal that she was saving the seat, so I went and sat somewhere else. Because I was going to go there because when, when we said good, our goodbyes the night before and she walked away, the only thing that I thought was, my, 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 my. <laughs> now, I didn't know this at the time, but I had never been in love. I would never been in love. Because in my life, it was just like, well, somebody come around, they'd be there, and I'd say, well, okay, I guess that must be the one. They're here, you know, like that. <laughs> So we had this wonderful courtship. Everybody around us knew. We didn't know. You know, I'd, I'd watch her at meeting, and she'd, she'd look my way. I'd smile, look away, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm studying the tiles, you know. And, and, if, and, and, and if I looked her way, she'd smile, look away, you know. And the, I mean, I looked around the room. I, looked at, I immediately picked out all the guys I thought were interested in her. And I said, I'll get them. <laughs> I'll get them one by one. <laughs> Well, we would go to, to Denny's, you know, or a place like that, and we would go and sit down, and we would have a coffee, and we talked and talked and talked and talked. We talked about kids, and we talked about furniture, and we talked about music, and we talked about places we'd, we'd like to go to or places we'd been to, and we talked about all our likes and dislikes and our lives, past lives. Because, you see, I wanted to find out, because I, I knew I was 47 years old, and I knew that I hadn't a clue as to what I was looking for. So I had made a list of what I wanted in this other person. And I didn't know this, but independently of me, she had made a list. So we were checking each other out real good. <clears throat> and it looked like she was kind of filling in just about everything on the list. And I was being real careful. But I... I wouldn't, I wouldn't date her, in, like, and we went to dance one time, and I think that was about the date, right, baby? And that was about the date. And because I had, I had never really fallen in love except one time. And I'll tell you about that now. I was back when I first came to AA the first time, and I had been sober maybe a few weeks or a few months, and I was working as an electrician, working in a furniture store. And there I saw the love of my life. I mean, she was beautiful. There was this slender blonde with these sad brown eyes. And I knew I was in love. Unfortunately, it was a portrait, see. And uh, I, I couldn't afford it because it was too expensive anyway. But it haunted me. Everything about it, the, the New York skyline and the, the fiery red sky and every, every feature of her face. And I felt at that time like I, I should just take my tools off, throw them on the floor, and go up to New York and walk the streets until I found that this person really existed, you know, just like that. But I didn't. But I never forgot it. So anyway, back to the courtship. So here we are. We're getting to know each other. And before we ever held hands, I knew that she was the one, but I didn't know how I was going to ask her. And I chickened out three or four times, you know, just couldn't get the words out. And eventually one night I met her at Denny's. We met there about 11 o'clock at night, and at 3 in the morning she said to me, well, you know, we probably ought to call this an evening, you know, we've been drinking tea all night, and, you know, wore, wore a track to the bathroom and back. And, and I said, yeah, I guess so, and I still couldn't ask her. She thought that something was very strange about this man, and she figured, oh, he's going to tell He can't figure out how to tell me he doesn't want to see me anymore. So we went out to the car, and I said to her, uh, can we just sit and talk for a little while? And she kind of looked at me like, you know, we've been doing this for four hours. So we sat down, and finally I said to her, well, there's something I'd like you to think about. And she said, what's that? I said, I'd like you to think about us being married. And she said, okay, I can do that. I said, well, no, what I mean is, will you marry me? Can you marry me? You know, I just couldn't say it. So she did this number. She looked at her hands for about 300 years <laughs> while I held my breath and said, yes, I'll marry you. A couple of weeks later, we were coming from a dance, and one of the last songs that they played at the dance was 
uh, by uh, air supply. You're every woman in the world to me. You're my fantasy. You're my reality, right? Okay. And so I, men talk a lot. You know, you girls know that, right? You just ask them a few questions and you're set for the night. <laughs> so I started talking and I said to her, you know, there was only one time in my life that I can ever remember feeling about anyone the way I feel about you. She said, oh. So I started telling her about the portrait. And she got real quiet. And after I finished, she was still quiet. And then she said, you know, I posed for that portrait 22 years ago. My wife was a model. I want you to meet the woman in the portrait. Beverly, would you please stand up and let them see you? Oh, it gets better. I don't know if any of you are atheists in here, and I don't know what that does for your unbelief, but it gets better. We lived for years within a few miles of each other. Our children went to the same school. She worked for the lady that lived next door to my aunt, who I saw at least once a week. We bought gas at the same gas station, shopped in the same grocery stores, ate in the same restaurants. We never saw each other until it was right. We had a wonderful wedding. We were a lot more thrilled than our kids. They weren't as thrilled as we were. <laughs> and you know, the, the, when it's, life is never, you know, happily ever after. It never is. I mean, Beverly and I, so much in love, still so much in love. She's my best friend, my companion, my lover, my wife. We're always together. We've always been together ever since we got married. I mean, I go to work, and after a couple of hours, she calls me, I call her. You know, she's doing stuff around the house. She's ready for me to leave after a couple of hours. You know, she's ready for me to come back. We're always together. In 1989, my wife had a stroke. And she was paralyzed. And the stroke left her with a seizure disorder. And I remember how I reacted at the time. Because I got to a point where no matter what I did, no matter what meetings I went to, no matter who I talked to, I always had this, this feeling that somehow she was going to die when I wasn't there. And if I called her up and she didn't answer the phone, we live out in the country, I'd come back home. And I remember the fear and the agony and the pain of doing all this. And, and in a lot of ways, I, I really didn't fulfill my part. But my wife is a very brave woman. And I watched her struggling in the kitchen with her arm that didn't work too good, trying to hold on to the lettuce and trying to tear it with the other one and doing things because she just wouldn't give up. And I remember the days when she had 50 seizures a day. And I got real good at knowing what to do about that. Then we went to meetings, and, and uh, around this time, her son was, was uh, doing drugs, and, and, and he was on his own suicide mission. And we, he had been in jail, and then we didn't bail him out. And now he had come out of jail, come, got sick, been in the hospital, almost died, came to live with us, and after a few weeks had said, I choose to use drugs. And we said, out of here. And a lot of things that aren't happily ever after were happening in our life. And during this time, my wife had to seek some professional help. One of the good things that came out of that was as a result of professional help, she joined Al-Anon. And she's a member of Al-Anon today. My stepson has got six and a half years, clean time, tens meetings, 
almost every day. My stepdaughter goes to Al-Anon. She hates it. She's new. <laughs> her mother's been after her for years. Her husband is an AA. He's got eight and a half months of sobriety. One of my sons should be here. He hadn't made it yet. We went through a real hard time. We picked ourselves up. We got going again. Got busy. Got work. You know, life started going along. Last year, my wife was diagnosed with connective tissue disease as a result of uh, breast implants that she had 21 years ago when she was married to jerks. In July, disease had progressed so much in my wife's body that she was so sick that she couldn't get out of bed. She was unable to care for herself. She wanted to die. She said to me, please, please let me die, let me die. And I said, anything that I could say, anything that I could think of to keep her from dying, no, you can't, I need you. You can't die, what am I going to do? Your kids are coming down, this, that, anything. Then they came down and, and we, we did everything we could to try to you know, if you don't want to live, you're not going to live to keep her going because she was scheduled for surgery in a month. And somewhere along the way, she said, all right, all right, I'll do it for you. I said, do it for our love. On August 15th of this year, my wife had major surgery. You saw her. She's beautiful. She stood up and waved to you. What you don't know is that she is in a tremendous amount of pain nearly all of the time, and headaches. She suffers from exhaustion. That it's going to take two years, God willing, for her to recover. And I can tell you all this because I can tell you that she's one of the bravest people I ever met. And none of this would be possible for her or for me if it wasn't for a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, where a helpless, hopeless alcoholic who had no illusions about the fact that he was not going to make it walked into a room one day on January 20th of 1969 and was greeted with love and understanding and care. People that held coffee cups for you because you couldn't hold them yourself. None of this would be possible if it hadn't been for all the old timers who were in the area that time who shared their wisdom, their experience, strength, and hope with me. None of this would have been possible if it hadn't been for sponsors that loved me when I was unlovable. And believe me, I was. People that said to me, okay, so you don't believe in God, but act as if. There would be no God in my life today if it hadn't have been for Alcoholics Anonymous because AA showed me the God of my understanding and taught me how to pray to this God, that I could talk to God. And God has blessed us richly. We remembered something that we heard a long time ago at one period when Beverly was going through a particularly tough time, and we said to each other, well, if we get lemons, I guess we'll just have to make lemonade, and it got us through that day. There was a man in England that was a great actor. His name was McCorkle, and he went back to his hometown, and he was going to do a recital in that town. And they had all the townspeople out in this little town of several hundred people. And uh, he got up, and when they asked him to recite his favorite lines of verse, and he recited the 23rd Psalm. And when he finished, he had a thunderous standing ovation. And, I mean, it was just wonderful to behold. And after all of the festivities were over, they asked the old priest who had been the tutor for this actor if he would recite some of his favorite lines. And he said, well, I'll be glad to, but... It's the 23rd Psalm. 
And he got up, and he was a very old man, and he recited the 23rd Psalm. And when he finished, there wasn't a sound in the room. And it lingered to the point of being uncomfortable. And McCorkle stood up and he said, Father, I think I know what happened here tonight. See, I know the words to the verses, but you know the author. And Alcoholics Anonymous introduces us to the author through you. Because we're all daily miracles, sharing our experience, strength, and hope with each other one day at a time. There's no mistakes in AA. We're all connected. We're all where we're supposed to be. Every speaker that I've heard here, I know, has touched me and also has touched each and every one of you. There's not anyone here that hasn't spoken to me, that hasn't given me something that I can take back with me because we truly are connected. Because we've all walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And God is with us one day at a time. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.